I mean, to uh, it's more palatable to the healthcare uh, professionals. But what have we done for injured workers? We've helped them. We've helped them get in and out and down the road by doing that too. So there's two things we're solving. Yes, yes sir. Right. My name is ETM with Mountain States. I'm, I've been doing claims for 30 years. I've been with Mountain States since the first lot or since the last lot came into effect. I did prior lot, I did interim lot. And the new lot changed a lot of things. But like Dan said, some of us here, including especially attorneys, see a very small portion of the actual claims. I've handled tens of thousands of claims and maybe 2,000 of them are litigated. So th th these are issues that if we're going to do a study, we need to include all the claims, not just litigated claims and not just, and when it comes down to it, the selection of healthcare provider issue is, is pretty minimal. I mean, I've, I've had in 30 years of handling claims, uh, I've probably 100 litigated claims over, over this issue. It's some of you that, that are actually have a juris doctorate see a lot more of these because it's you in litigation, but from a day-to-day -day claims handling standpoint, this isn't an issue. I mean, we that have to jump through different hoops. And originally, our employers we would say, don't even hand them a phone book because that will constitute some sort of extra care. And we've adapted throughout the years, and now we do the how letter, but it's not an issue. We just want to do the same thing that they want is get that veteran back to work. That's just kind of my opinion. The bigger issue is that there aren't doctors telling us they want to care. Except, uh, They're in line. From my perspective, that's the bigger problem than the solution <laughs> issue. I mean, if you're fighting over a two doctors to send you to anyway, that's a bigger issue. So, I, I also want to say that you two speak some beautiful Spanish. It's absolutely perfect. <laughs> she had me um, interpret in my own darn trial. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really kind of sketchy, but it's a good word for you. It's a good word for you. What are 
Austin Mill next to that, so I, there's just so much in my brain for that. So. I mean, I think when you talk about the city versus the rural, um, and I've gotten that firsthand, um, and I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to talk about why I was doing that, but I've been um, to over 20 of the 33 counties in New Mexico over this past summer. Um, my wife is running for an office, I'll just say that. And, um, and there is definitely a divide between the urban New Mexico and the rural New Mexico. And one of those divides is medical care. And so if, if you're in Raton or if you're in Lordsburg, um, you don't have a whole lot of choice, whether you're an injured worker or you know you, you have you broke your arm playing tennis or something or, or whatever. Drawn from a horse. Drawn from a horse, thank you. <laughs> um, and so I mean work comp suffers the same challenge. And you know, I don't think we're gonna get a New Mexico ortho in Lordsburg, are we? No. We have one in Farmington, right? We got some providers in Farmington. Okay, all right. I thought there was big coverage in Farmington from the marketing I saw. But but um, so that that is a challenge. And I have client, I have a client from Hobbs who, you know, for a while there was monthly coming to Albuquerque to get his ankle treated because there was no place else to go near where he was living with his family. And thankfully, you know, <coughs> you know the opposing counsel insurance company agreed to that and he's provided, he, he's moving with his treatment. Um, so, I mean, I don't think that's an issue that we can solve, that issue. Um, but I do think we can make things clearer for the users of the system as to how they get their benefits and, or who's treating them when they get injured. <coughs> And that can be done, as Jacob has said, by rule and by legislation, and then also by education. I think we can do that. Um, and I mean, there are people who are talking, um, and they may not always agree, but there is a conversation going. And, yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. To follow up on this thing about rural New Mexico, particularly the east side, Lubbock is closer than Albuquerque for a lot of these people. And it used to be pretty common for my client to end up in Lubbock. That doesn't happen much anymore. And I think part of it is because we've got some very onerous rules about trying to qualify out-of-state providers. Um, is anybody able to address a better way to do that than what we have now? Particularly That's as big for home being corners. Corners. You know, look, Clovis goes to Lubbock, a lot of ours in El Paso, because we don't have a trauma one, so they get they get shipped to El Paso immediately. Okay, there we uh, there. The last yeah. presentation that we had legislatively on that issue, and I, I can't speak to the comp context, but the real issue that was presented to us by the medical society was the difference in medical malpractice rate between New Mexico and Texas. And if we're gonna have a serious conversation, we need to include that. That's correct. That's correct. I know so what, I'm but, just saying but, what but the I'm medical saying, society presented well, to the legislature. Let me finish, Bob. I'm just saying, the last conversation that was presented is there is a conversation happening that medical malpractice is higher in New Mexico than in Texas, right? And so if that is true or it is not true, I think that is part of the conversation that needs to happen. Because I hear it from doctors all the time. I'm not saying I believe it. I'm just saying, as a legislator, who is approached by doctors, and who is approached by the medical society, and whose fiance is a fourth year medical student about to become a physician, and is looking at what being a doctor is like as a business around the country, New Mexico doesn't fare too well. So Bob. And I disagree because I've seen other statistics on That's it. fine. And that is just, that is, I mean, that is a legislative argument, and both sides, you know. That's a would, tort argument on the And ramp up, out of our, ramp out of the worst top, case right? scenarios. The problem is getting the doctors paid. That is, in my experience, is getting them paid from out of state. And one, Dr. Vichia talked about it, and Dr. Black talked about it, how onerous uh, the paperwork is um, for getting paid or getting authorizations. And then two, um, they can work comp pays less. 
in New Mexico than in California or Texas or Arizona or Colorado. And, um, and they don't want to take less, generally. Um, I've, I've sent lots of, well, some clients out of state, and the doctors, for various reasons that I've been able to find, have accepted the map. But most doctors out of state don't. And I think that's a big problem. Here's an organization that whose business is recruiting doctors to New Mexico. I don't remember their name, but I have their contact information somewhere written down. They should be involved in this 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 little piece of the conversation. What are the issues? We need to put a box on the form. Would you like to do work comp? <laughs> they all come back zero. That'd be a pretty good answer. Okay. You don't want me to be the one who calls them and tells them that. You want somebody from the agency. Okay. Part of the equation, though, is what you get paid. It's also what your overhead is. Yeah. Okay. Your overhead is higher in New Mexico. Not only are the, the rates lower for most insurances, uh, the malpractice rates are higher, and, and there's real uh, worry that they may go substantially higher in the near future if the patient compensation fund goes broke. But also, we pay gross receipts tax, which no, there's only one other. We pay one. two. No, <laughs> so you pass it on well, to your client. We pay it. We're not allowed to pass it on to our clients. Yes, exactly. There's only one other state in the entire country that, that does that. That's Why Hawaii. That? Speak to the legislature. <laughs> We're working on it through the medical mm -hmm. society. But no, we are not allowed to pass on gross receipts tax for insurance. And so that's why you can't get positions here. I take a 7% pay cut off the top with gross receipts tax on a lot of my income. You have such a great standard of living. Right. It's a beautiful place. It's a very pretty place to practice. But I'm saying, if we want to really tackle these hard issues, as Linda, Linda was saying, it's not those are these aren't easy conversations because there are some real tough political fights involved. Here. They're just aren't. If you want to talk about the global issues, and I'm not disagreeing with Bob, I think a lot of what he raises is important. But as Dr. Ritchie said, if we don't look at all the problems involved in our provider shortage, we're doing ourselves a disservice. When you think about gross receipts tax, you're talking about 7%. Well, when you get by the outside of Albuquerque, I believe, what is it? It's, is it an Espanola that it's 8%? Yeah, it's 8%. Yeah. So, you know, you have it. So you look at places like Espanola, really? I mean, that that's an added. So you're a provider. You, I mean, so I think we really do need to look at the environment a bit. And there must be a way. The, the other part of this equation that, that hasn't come up is, is the type of practices. Um, because in Espanola, there aren't any private practice physicians, basically, in part because of that. So, and that's going more and more that way around the state, that, that providers are working for Pre Presbyterian or Loveless. Um, and, you know, then that throws a whole different part of the equation into it. And yes, you may actually get a break on your malpractice, someone else is paying for it, but you don't get the participation in the community. A lot of these are visa doctors, they come and go. Um, and so you really, and, and there's not any incentive in those networks to take or come. Because if you're getting paid by RVU, guess what? An RVU on a non-comp patient is a lot easier earned than an RVU on a comp patient. Yeah, what does that mean? A resource value unit. And it was originally designed just to study, try to quantify how much work is, is put into taking care of a patient or, or doing something. It was, it was only for study uh, to write papers. However, the government got hold of it and decided we're going to pay doctors now. And so it's a way to measure and compare what a, what a surgeon does, what a non surgeon does, you know. And everything is assigned to a new value. And they can be manipulated. They, they, they're paid in different ways, but there's, there's, I've never seen a differential in people that work in this comp. If I ever go under a system where I'm paid by RVUs, what am I going to insist on? Or I won't take work comp. And you're saying work comp takes longer because there's more paperwork involved? or what? Because of secondary payment, an issue of the worker. 
you have to convince them to go back to work many times um, because of paid work, because of having, say, a nurse case manager there that then you're, you're talking with and dealing with, and that takes additional time. Um, you know, all of those things add up. And so a work comp visit takes substantially longer than a non-work comp visit. By how much? I, I mean, obviously it goes yeah, you know, very broad, but at least 20% longer. Okay. And frequently it's 100% longer. Why? What, what is it entailed in taking longer? It, it can report. take me literally 20 minutes to convince and to argue with some worker about going back to work. If he insists, I can't go back to work. It's too early to go back to work. You know, I, I, I can't work. Uh, yeah, I know it's just my shoulder and I still have two good legs and one, another good arm and, and I can sit at a desk and answer phones, but but that's uncomfortable. Or I can't stand all day doing something, even though it was your shoulder. This is all conversations I've had in the last week. Right. Okay. Um, that, that yes, it was your shoulder, you know, that, that I fixed, but I can't stand all along on, on concrete, you know, and fumes that, that I've always always been able to tolerate when I was working as an MDC mechanic. I can tolerate those fumes when I was working as a mechanic, but I can't work as a mechanic because now I've got a shoulder in a sling and I have to do paperwork. Now I can't tolerate those fumes. But then there, there's differentials built into the billing, such as the CPT code of 99212 versus 99204, where there's extra time built. Doesn't that, is it, that's what it's designed for, is to make it difference. is. Ma making that hurdle sometimes is difficult. Getting it paid, again, is difficult as well. Uh, and you have to have a, a provider knowledgeable enough to know they can build it. But you know what the hurdle is to get to a, a higher, like to go, go to a, a, a 99214 uh, for time is 45 minutes. Right. I go broke if I take 45 minutes seeing every patient. I literally cannot meet my overhead. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a substantial penalty, time penalty, in seeing work on patients. If you talk to any provider, physical therapist, any type of physician, they will tell you there's a substantial time penalty aside from the paperwork. See, these are things that, that adjusters well, don't know. know. So I mean, I know. this is probably 30 years doing this. This is the first time I've ever heard this. This is amazing. And, and I brought up at the Medical Advisory Board you know, multiple times in the past to talk about EM coding and why there, it should be higher than private insurance and not the same or lower. Or lower. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, if, if you feel that it's time for the work to return to work, and whether, you know, people feel it's light duty, why do you argue or try to convince the worker? And, and, I, and I understand part of it is probably a compassionate part of it, but eventually there comes a point in time, kind of like arguing with a, a teenager, where you say, no, you need home at 11 or, or else, and end the discussion. So, I mean, and, and I'm not, I appreciate you you know, counseling them and spending that time, but if it is such a burden, why don't you cut it short? Well, most physicians just decide not to take those patients. Don't, don't see work on patients. That's the easiest thing to do. Right. Okay. Um, for those of us who still do, we, we do try to cut it short. Uh, realize that now part of how my reimbursement from Medicare is based on my um, scores on Google and Yelp and things like that. And do you know how many workers have, have dinged me, given me one star because I sent them back to work too early or wouldn't give them drugs? Those are the two most common reasons. Wow. Um, and so that's part of it. But that's um, not something the system can. No, 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 no. But but that's but but that and that and I don't I don't practice based on how many stars I think I can get. Um, <laughs> I'm well, I won't say that. Um, but um, you know, they, they will just hound you. They will hound you. They won't leave the, the exam room, or they will threaten you, or um, or you will literally have to fire them from the practice. And boy, is that a, a paperwork nightmare? You know that because they you know they will not accept you saying that. And that's one thing where the ODG guidelines did help me put those in. Because now I can I can say that. Well, you know, we've got these guidelines the state goes by. It says, you know, you should be going back to work at this time. Usually I don't even say that. I say, I've been doing this for 20 some odd years. You know, and that's just the way it is. Because that's the way, you know, 
other work comp people and non work comp people that just when they're ready to go back. But it still takes time. You know, we're not talking about spending an hour talking to them, but if I spend an extra, you know, 10 minutes on every patient, then I'm two hours behind by the end of the day or more. Does a nurse case manager extend that or, or I mean, would a nurse case manager help explain it to a worker more? I'm just trying to think of ways to streamline it for you. You know, there are many physicians, especially when I started, it was always, you know, people were, were you know, down or were telling me you don't want a nurse case manager in there or they don't help or, or it takes more time, whatever. I've kind of found the opposite. Usually a nurse case manager does help and they can spend time educating the, the worker and telling the worker that, you know, and, and telling them that, you know, it's the right thing or, or be willing to take over from me. When I say, look, you know, that's the way it is, you know, I'm going on the next patient. He or she can then spend time telling them, yes, that is really the way it is. That's kind of what I've so heard. I, I actually think it is money well invested for a lot of cases. And like you've said before, the vast majority of cases don't need things, they don't go to litigation, whatever. But um, I'd say for, for benefiting for nurse case managers, certainly more than go to litigation. It, it's actually a pretty decent percentage. Can I add to that, Bill? Yeah. Um, I, I find that sometimes the nurse case manager has a different agenda than I had for that appointment. And that, that becomes um, somewhat problematic because they're there for that appointment. But you know, I had, I had my agenda already set up for that patient from the previous visit and the nurse case manager wasn't at that visit. So they come in now with a totally different agenda. So I either have to change my agenda and only address that, or I have to extend the visit. And so it, it makes it problematic when it's unplanned for, like that. That's true. That makes sense. Although usually I'll just run rough shot over the Those Those instances where you're getting pushback from the worker about returning to work, how many of those instances is there a job waiting for the worker? Just in general. Or is it just the fact that you're releasing them? Right. Um, I think that's real hard to say. Maybe 50 50, I don't know. You know, a lot of times I may not know that. Or because a lot of times I don't know if they're being given a job. A lot of times that's where your case manager helps. Your case manager will tell me, you know, oh, these works aren't going to let them bring back. They're not going to do any like, or they'll accept anything. They're like the post office, they'll take you back as long as you're not a veteran. Um, and so that may play a factor sometimes, but I, I don't think so. Yeah. It, it, it's like, you know what, the number one number one indicator prognostically on how well a, a worker's going to do in going back and re return to work and stuff? Mm -hmm. No, I don't. Job satisfaction. Yeah. By far. Yeah. By far. Much higher than age, sex. Um, anything else, and, and not even so much pay, although job satisfaction obviously reimbursement plays into that. And then, as a follow up, if the worker has an attorney, does it make a difference in your experience? Hard to say because I don't always know if they have an attorney or not, although a lot of times they probably will. Right. Um, I think that no, I, I think that it doesn't, or else it's actually positive and it helps them go back. Well, that's what I mean. I don't, I don't ever, I never get the sense that their attorney's telling them not to go back or somebody not giving them advice to, to resist it. I don't get that. Well, I try to educate my clients um, and say, okay, you know, you had the surgery, um, Dr. Ritchie said, ninth day, you're probably going to get MMI, you need to start preparing yourself. Um, and, and that seems to help. Absolutely. And that's where nursing case management will help too, because they'll do the same education. Yep. I agree. I think it is a good, a good thing that we're having.
thing. And one of the things that used to happen, and you were part of it, was the Business Labor Coalition, which blew up um, not because of the people who were part of the Business Labor Coalition, but because of outside political forces, I think. And um, the labor side had, had no choice at that point. But I think um, when we get a new administration, it might be helpful if we could try to resurrect that. Um, but um, there would have to be some, some changes made, I know, uh, for labor to come back. And, and I, I think as well. Go ahead. I think that's true, but that is going to mean on all sides, employers, um, providers, um, employers, you know, when we're talking about labor, that is going to mean having to be willing to set a rule of engagement that doesn't say, the minute it gets uncomfortable, I'm, I'm backing up into my group. I mean, there's going to have to be on all sides a maturity and a willingness to say, you know what, we do need to look at this. I mean, because, and I think that's for all of us. I mean, myself too, is that it's gonna mean a reach and when we start having people back off have to say no but but there's gonna be i mean there's, there's gonna be issues where we're never gonna have consensus but we can get around them. well i haven't been able to get around them but the, and what i'm gonna and i'll just say it what i'm talking about is labor was dispossessed on the advisory council by this current administration for a period of time and um and then you know labor had no choice to do what they did um because the administration up in Santa Fe was not listening and, and doing what should have been done according to the act. But that, you know, we're gonna get a new administration and I don't wanna rehash that. I don't, because I, I mean, I'm not a labor member. I, I support labor, um, but, um, but that was a useful group for at least airing out differences. And um, sometimes we were able to come to consensus and move some things through. Um, but uh, but just in terms of talking, I think it was an excellent group. Um, but you know, there are some I have lines I I won't cross because I think it will hurt my clients and workers in general. You know, um, I've been involved in this advisory thing for several years, and I came back on in '11, and I was here in '98. Um, and saw some of those things back in the first administration I worked for. There was uh, labor and business the coalition pretty strong back then. And then when I came back in, it was, it was still together, but it was really fractured. And then by what I call bad judgment from the fourth floor, they they put four business reps on because they didn't really read the book but then they corrected that and then now we've been you know beat over the head with that until some of us are kind of tired and there's uh, I'll say this and <coughs> there's the, the, the labor community certain individuals there don't think that anyone on the advisory council that's a union member uh, our police officer that think he's worth a darn because he's not uh, part of the labor. I, I asked him, I said, that being the payroll? I don't think our chairman is, is worth a darn because he works for a business, even though he's a safety professional, a business that's an R. And so that's really distressing. So my, I think this group needs to tell labor and business what they're going to do get them to jump on. I'd rather see uh, exploiting this kind of deal where we need a bigger room and we get some really good direction. And the practitioners need to do it, not the business and labor in the group over there. If we get along, we're fine. If we don't get along, we're not. It's blowing up here. It's just, that's old news. That, that's like old technology to me. I think it should be practitioners. Because look at the things that we've discovered today that a lot of us didn't know. Uh, I mean, even new professionals, not just the builder, I don't know much about anything, but this, this has been really, really good. It's put together kind of softly because uh, 
that's kind of the way I do things sometimes. But man, I'll tell you, these guys really have, have, have really brought a lot to the table. And I think it's, I think we keep this panel, we can change people as we want, but I think we do more of these. And, and we try to get things that we can do by rules or legislation. Or if, if you get everyone in this room to agree, which is trial lawyers, which is adjusters, which is legislation, which is judges, which is docs, labor and business will listen. They'll listen to what, where you're going. So, uh, just a moment. Go ahead. Well, I yes, wanted to thank Jessica Sanchez. You said there were coordinators and we just talked and I agree, I, I observed as well. And I do outreach on behalf of the BCA statewide, trying to encourage employers to let go to work right now. And it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot to, to take on. We at Medical Class Company Rent have talked about doing more outreach to more health care providers to try and recruit people and more health care providers into the system. One idea we started researching on your state is a health services coordinator register staff where there'd be a WPA employee designated to kind of help them streamline things the way um, your name does for the medical billing system. So there's some things that WPA could possibly do without having legislation per se that really could help usher things through. But the idea was in starting the early return to work initiative is that the community would have to ask us to want to have these services and <coughs> what we currently provide. So that's kind of where we're feels like we're starting out in a way to do more outreach and do things, but I think if the community asks for that, that could be another thing that starts us to perhaps get into the work. You know, and that that comes down to the when they set the system up of the the fees they don't work. They generated significant money. And then over the years, um, it probably comes from different administrations. Well, don't spend all that because you need to give a million and a half to workforce over this and then our sweet $10 million. We well, you know, it's $30 million, $30 million in 10 years. That's a lot of money. So how many more programs is that paid for? How many more Jessica's and Henry Callum to get things done? I mean, we need, you know, we, we, we tried to do it. I said, look, take the tax away on the employee. And they wouldn't hear it. People wouldn't hear it. It was more of a push take the tax credit employer and don't sweep anymore. So we were, you know, we were, but that's something, Sander, we, we really, and this is prime time with a few bucks in the bank, you know, I agree they gotta do GRT, they gotta do these other things, but they need to quit taking money from, or lower the fee, but I don't believe that. I think there's plenty of work to do. Well, I'll tell you what the real problem has been. What, what people are referring to is, you know, the, the workers' comp fee goes into the state fund, should go to this administration. Every year, since I've been there, every year there's just language in House Bill 2, our omnibus appropriation bill, that takes a certain percentage fee. It's literally built into the legislature's budget projection. So, you know, it, 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 we shouldn't do it. Um, hopefully we will stop doing it now. But... I will tell you the opposition that idea runs into is once that money goes to the general fund, it's just it's 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 money you could spend for the checking account, and no one likes earmarking revenue even when it's specifically uh, charged for that purpose. <coughs> the Senate Finance Committee will do everything it can to un earmark those appropriations. So I definitely support doing that. I think the resources need to continue flowing to the administration. I think there's a strong argument to stop that practice, but it's gonna take some conversation um, from whoever the new director is going through transition to the new administration, whoever that is, to make that a priority. And when you're saying about you know increased resources, it really falls on the director of the WCA to push uh, for those lines to be included in, in your appropriation. Because even though you have that fee, House Bill 2 still has to appropriate the money. You know, and we still get to say what that money can be for. So that those are opportunities for internal advocacy, I would say. In many past years, we put on, the WCA put on seminars that were intended, actually there were several that were intended specifically for the advisory council. 
So the advisory council members themselves would get up to speed because as business and labor representatives and not practitioners and not experts, they needed to get up to speed on all of these arcane matters of the statute. You know, if you come in brand new to the advisory council and you've never heard of healthcare provider selections before, it's gonna be really hard to talk about it intelligently until you've learned about it. So we did that a number of times and then advisory council members started not coming. So <coughs> there is that option for, uh, you know, in the next administration for the WTA to do that stuff. Great. I have tried to put lawyers with work comp experience <coughs> on the advisory council by um, turning out the statute. It, what's that? It's not in the statute. Yeah. Right well, it the statute. precludes. It specifically yeah. precludes. So we yeah. could we could trade uh, some shells if you like. Well, well <laughs> I trade some shells if it'll make if it'll make it a better yeah. a better organization. <laughs> I mean, because right, workers and a defense lawyer. Yes, my my proposed. Legislation had specific language. And I, think it had, I think it actually had a minimum um, time of practice, also, like five or ten years. Was that Eli's bill? No, no, no. This was a long time ago. I've, I've given the up on that. The original advisory council had three extra members: one representing lawyers, one representing insurance mm -hmm. companies, and one representing the healthcare sector. And then that was done away with a couple of years later. Hmm. Yes, there's no okay. You guys have done really good. Uh, Courtney, would you like to say anything? No, I'd just like to thank you guys for being here. This was very informative. Thank you guys. Thank you.